So what we're going to be talking about is um, the uncertainty in our life loss analysis and how we can sort of identify our key uncertainties, what those might look like, all the different parameters we have uncertainty in. Uh, we'll talk about how we sort of address that within our life sim model. Um, this is a little bit specific to life sim, so if you're using some sort of other tool to estimate consequences, um, a lot of the outputs and a lot of the graphs I show are from life sim, but the same underlying principles would apply to any study you're working on. So first of all, what is uncertainty? Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen something similar to this or seen the infamous video on we know what, or we know what we know and we know what we think we know and we know what we don't know, uh, but we don't know what we don't know, right? So there's all these different sort of factors that play into this um, and they kind of fall in this continuum of facts to surprises. Um, and so we're trying to account for any of those um, within our analysis to help us ensure that we're able to verify sort of our results and confirm that they seem reasonable and we don't end up with a situation like we did at Viant Dam where we had really great assumptions that just turned out to be totally wrong, right? So why do we care about uncertainty? Um, Obviously, we're just unsure of the, the range of possibilities. We just don't have a good grasp on all the things that could happen, how they will happen, when they will happen. Um, it's the who, what, when, where, why, who's going to be affected, uh, what's going to be your failure mode, all these sorts of things. You know, there's just a huge range of uncertainty in this. Um, and we want to be able to understand if all those uncertainties we have, what are the critical ones that can affect our decision on how we prioritize our funds um, and our resources to hopefully reducing or um, mitigating potential life loss. <clears throat> so key types of uncertainty, I'm sure you all have seen these big words before. I just think of knowledge uncertainty versus natural variability. Knowledge uncertainty would be something we could reduce. Um, it's something that the answer exists for. We've just got to put in the effort and the time and the money, what have you, to find the answer. Um, of course, no uncertainty is completely able to be eliminated to zero, but at least with knowledge uncertainty, we can do better most of the time, right, if we just have the resources to do so. Um, natural variability, these are the things that we really can't do anything about. We just know they're uncertain. You know, think about precipitation is like the main one that usually comes to people's mind, right? Like, can't predict the weather. Um, meteorologists would tell you otherwise, but we all know that, you know, they're not always doing a great job of that. So, um, these are kind of the key two types we're going to think about. First one's our loading scenarios. And so this is something that you could sort of do like a scenario type analysis within life sim, for example. But life sim itself does not, um, as Corby alluded to earlier, really account for the sensitivity of or, or, or the change in breach parameters and all the sensitivity to breach parameters and those sorts of assumptions that go into your hydraulic and hydrology modeling. So we have a lot of assumption right off the bat when we move into a consequence model and we move into a life sim type model. Uh, we've already started at a place where like, is this really how this is going to look? Is this what it's going to look like? Is this how the breach is going to develop and the time period it's going to develop in? So we're already sort of starting at a place of uncertainty. Um, then within our life sim model itself, we have a lot of input parameters that go into our model. So for instance, um, our road networks, as some people have mentioned earlier in class, um, we don't really know what traffic's going to look like. We could maybe get an idea of like average daily, what is it, 80, some, there's an acronym for it, average daily counts on specific roads. We could get information like that and reduce some of our knowledge and certainty around that. But on any given day, when a dam failure may occur, we don't really know what the traffic's going to be looking like. Is there going to be any traffic? Is it going to happen at nighttime when people are home? Um, is it going to happen during the daytime, during rush hour, when everyone's on the road? So things to think about. Um, whenever there is an event, we're doing evacuation, how might contraflow, allowing people to travel different ways on road segments or people just choosing to do that on their own because they approach a flooded road and have to turn around? How do we account for those things? How will that play out? Again, we don't really know. Um, our structure inventory, obviously, obviously a lot of uncertainty in that, especially when you're working with really large inventories where you can have hundreds of thousands of structures. You know, the good old boys like to go out and do window surveys still, but we don't have the time or the money to go to every individual structure, right? But we do have ways that, that those are knowledge and certainties. There's something we can do if we really needed that information. We can go to those structures, get that information, take measurements of the first floor elevation, 
um, understand what the construction types of that home are. So this would be a, a good example of knowledge and certainty and something we could do something about if we had a lot of uncertainty. Our population at risk, um, we don't always know what the future holds, right? Like, is there going to be a migration out of a particular community? Is there going to be a migration into a particular community? How might land use changes impact your study area? So we could have, again, we can have a little bit of um, knowledge and certainty about current conditions, but there's a lot of natural variability in those future conditions when an event could potentially occur. Emergency management. Um, again, this is one that doesn't uh, get directly accounted for within life sim. We just don't have a good way of uh, putting helicopters in our model and swooping down and picking up people and those sorts of things. Um, but it is something to consider when we're walking through this. Uh, natural variability and how many people would get rescued during an event. But we can reduce some of that knowledge uncertainty about if there's potential for rescue by going and talking with our emergency managers and seeing if they have that capability as well as the personnel. Um, so then we've got our destinations. So again, there's like this element of natural variability and knowledge and certainty here too. Where am I gonna go if I go to a road and it's flooded? Well, first, I'm personally probably gonna panic and call like my dad. Uh, what do I do if the road's flooded? Do you want me to walk across train tracks like when we were a kid? Like, I mean, I just don't know. I'm kind of kidding, but a lot of people don't know what to do and they do panic, right? So what are they going to do? Are they going to get out of their vehicle and start walk walking up? Are they going to turn around? Are they going to continue to try to drive through that flooded road? Um, we just don't know, but we can reduce some of our knowledge and certainty where people might consider to go because we can talk with our emergency managers and see what locations they would put into their notifications they sent to a public for evacuation and we can start sort of um, sending traffic that way in our model to sort of understand how traffic could potentially look like in those areas. Um, imminent hazard time. Um, so when's the breach going to occur? This is obviously a lot of natural variability and will intervention buy some time. So when you're looking at something like levee overtopping, for example, depending on where you are, you might consider, okay, there's a really good possibility. We have the resources, we have the personnel. Maybe we can sandbag and buy ourselves a little bit of time in this particular stretch of levee. Um, but in other failure modes, you're not gonna have that option, right? So there's, again, there's mostly natural variability, but there are some things we can do to help us get a better understanding of the potential there for um, intervention. And then our evacuation and vehicle parameters. Um, I don't remember if Woody talked about this or not, but um, by occupancy type within the life sim model, there's like default settings for how many people would leave a structure together at a time. So he mentioned for residential structures, the assumption is everyone receives the warning at the same time and then leaves together. And that would happen uh, with three people per vehicle. And so those are all editable parameters. And it's important to consider because what we don't want to do is we don't want to have, for instance, like a school or a hospital or a shopping center or something like that in our structure inventory where we've made the assumption that everyone's going to leave at the exact same time and they're all going to go in the same car, right? Like we want to consider, well, I might be shopping in Target and you come over the loudspeaker and tell me I need to leave, but there's just a few more things I got to get and I'm almost done, so I'm just going to finish checking out. Someone else is going to run out the store. Someone else is going to burn it down. So, you know, you just don't know, uh, but you want to consider those possibilities based off what type of structures you have in your inventory. So then, of course, there's all these um, warning and protective action uh, parameters that we have in the model and these of course have a lot of natural variability built into them. There are things again we can do to help us hone in a little bit by talking to emergency managers, doing elicitations with emergency managers, understanding the preparedness of the community, understanding the perception of the community of am I at risk or no I'm totally not at risk or I don't even know a dam exists like that's all helpful information and us helping sort of reduce our uncertainty and our warning and protective action parameters but no matter how much we reduce it there's still some natural variability between how many people are going to receive the warning how many people are going to take action with the warning how many people are going to attempt to take action but it's too late and so again things to consider stability we talked about a lot, this a lot yesterday um, so I won't go too much into that one. Fatality rates, again, Jason's done a good job of highlighting that. 
you know, we've got our case studies, and in some, some situations we've had people do really well in uh, really bad situations, and then other times we've had people do really poorly in uh, not so bad situations, right? Uh, relatively speaking, at least. So things to consider. Um, property damage rates, uh, so your occupancy, occupancy types, again, this is a knowledge uncertainty. If I'm assuming I've got 100,000 structures and I assume 80% of those are residential, but I don't really know, well, I can go on Google Earth, I can go on Google Map, what have you, and help myself reduce some of that uncertainty. Submergence criteria, again, this uh, hinges a lot on the limited mobility factor. So a lot of natural variability in this again, I myself, typically could probably climb up a ladder, go to a second story, but I also tore my MCL recently. Probably couldn't have done much when I was wearing that knee brace going around. And that's something we really can't account for, so that would be some natural variability there. And then willingness to enter a flooded road. Again, um, we really don't know what people are gonna do. None of us are very logical. Some of you are like sitting there like, yes, I'm an engineer, I'm extremely logical. But all of us have our things and we don't always know how we're gonna react in the face of danger. I just kind of point these slides out to show there are ways to account for all of these, or at least most of these, um, within our life sim model. So right here you're seeing foundation height where you can assign a distribution to that. Down here you see structure values where you can assign a distribution. Here we've got our submergence criteria. We've got um, our uh, occupancy type, so our depth of damage functions. We have our warning issuance delay, warnings going out, people taking, or taking protective action, when we will identify the hazard, how long it'll take that hazard to be communicated. Um, we already saw our warning issuance delay, but it shows up there again in your alternatives parameter. Um, and uh, this is willingness to enter a flooded road. Stability criteria. So I just point this out again to let you know not only do you need to think through these uncertainties, but you also have the opportunity to incorporate assumptions you have specific to your study area into the life sim model. So that's important to note. It's not just a, a conceptual pro uh, process. It's also something that you can um, compute and simulate. Lots of uncertainty, right? So how uh, do we identify our instrumental uncertainties? And what I mean when I say instrumental uncertainty is the uncertainties you have in your model that can influence your decision. So in this case, the uncertainties you have in your model that can change your life loss estimates in a way that's meaningful to how you allocate resources or um, come up with emergency evacuation plans and that sort of thing. So we talked about a lot of the different types of uncertainties and they all kind of fall into one of these groups, which is the key, key sort of elements of our model, which is where do people start out when the flood event or the dam event, the levee event occurs? Um, how do they move throughout the study area? Where do they end up? Where do they go? What kind of shelter are they left with? Are they in a car? Are they on their feet? Are they in a structure? Uh, the flood characteristics, again, can't emphasize enough. This is not one that LifeSim has the capability of modeling, but it is something you can do scenario type analysis for, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and then again, the shelter that they end up in. So now we're gonna talk about sort of some of the ways you can identify some of these instrumental certainties. And again, I can't tell you what they are for your specific model, because it's gonna be very different depending on your study area and the type of breach you're looking at. Um, and just all the circumstances and characteristics that make up your particular model. Um, so first things first, how do we handle uncertainty? Most of you are probably familiar with Monte Carlo analysis. This is basically assigning a distribution or a range of possibilities for a specific variable. And we do this um, by simulating this across multiple iterations. Um, I thought um, I had another slide in here, but we'll just talk about it. And so one thing to think about in a question we get often is how many iterations are enough iterations? And again, that's specific to your individual study, but the idea is that you want your, um, you want your results to reach convergence um, to a specific uh, sort of statistic, often the mean. Um, and that's something that we could talk about more offline if you're interested, but multiple iterations. So usually the more the better, right? As you increase your number of iterations, you're getting closer to whatever you, that true value would be. Um, so if you have the capability to compute more iterations, it's probably helpful to do so. 
um, I can tell you sort of a screening level, very um, sort of crude initial analysis we would do, probably 500 to 1,000 iterations. Um, but again, we've seen studies, Jordan has one in particular, uh, where we've got millions of structures in that inventory. And so we need a lot of iterations if we can. And if we can't, we need to understand what uncertainties are, um, we need to understand that we have a lot of uncertainty, right? Just in the fact that we aren't getting a true sort of convergence there, but then also what those uncertainties are. And so some of the Monte Carlo analysis we do, first there's um, certain parameters in the model use this distribution uh, sampling. You're seeing the willingness to enter a flooded road now. And so the blue line here is our lowest clearance vehicles and the red line is high clearance vehicles. I don't believe these are actually stacked in life sim. This is just so you can kind of see those. But the idea in distribution sampling is that I just find, I sample a point along that distribution. And so then we've got curve sampling um, or function sampling. So now you're seeing um, a depth of damage function. And you can't, it shows on my screen, but you can't see on your screen, this is all shaded blue. So that's sort of our uncertain bounds that we're working with between this red line and this blue line. And so what, I, what the model is going to do is for each iteration, first it's gonna sample a function within those bounds, and then I'm gonna sample a point on that function. So these are kind of the two ways that Monte Carlo um, analysis sampling is happening within the LifeSim model. So we were talking about instrumental uncertainties, how we can identify them. Again, it'll be different for each person's study. But there are some tools you can kind of use to help you determine what those instrumental uncertainties are. Uh, we'll go through a couple of examples of uncertainty plots and how we can use those to sort of help us understand our uncertainties. Um, we'll talk about sensitivity analysis. Uh, for purposes of consequence modeling, probably the, um, and, and specifically in LifeSim, probably the easiest way to do sensitivity analysis is by doing uh, what they refer to as one at a time sensitivity analysis. So changing one parameter, holding all other parameters constant, seeing how that inf impacts your overall results. And then also sort of, um, I put no warning scenario here, but this could be really any scenario analysis. So for example, if you're trying to figure out some of your um, breach uncertainty, you could have, as we often do, multiple loading scenarios in there and run a simulation for each of those. You can run uh, what I'm calling a no warning scenario. So you could run a simulation where you assume no one in the study area get, receives a warning and kind of use that as maybe like a worst case sort of scenario to help sort of ground yourself and your results. You could also do a no evacuation scenario where no one, uh, people don't leave their structure. There may be, so that would mean they would vertically evacuate and that could be good or bad depending on where you are and what the flood conditions are. So there's multiple ways that you can kind of address some of these uncertainties. These are probably the most common that I personally use and have seen other people uh, that are doing life sim modeling use, but this is not an exhaustive list. Oh. First, let's talk about some uncertainty plots. Um, so what you're looking at here, and I guess a quick 101 on correlation if you don't under, understand or have forgotten since college what uh, correlation is telling us. When we're looking at this plot, um, we don't see a strong correlation, right? Like you're not seeing really any trend in the data. Uh, on your y-axis, you have your total life loss. On your x-axis, we're looking specifically at the, ha uh, the imminent hazard ID uh, time, which is relative to breach time parameter. And so what this is telling me is that as long as my uncertainty bounds are between a half hour after breach occurs to three hours before breach occurs, meaning this is the possible range of times I might identify that there is a hazard looming, as long as I do it within this window, it doesn't necessarily correlate with my overall life loss. Does that make sense? Is everybody tracking with me so far? Okay, so looking at another one. So here we see a pretty strong negative correlation. We have this downward slope here. And again, we still have life loss on the y-axis, but now we've got PAI, protective action initiation curve, um, on our x-axis. And the next slide, we'll talk more about what that means. But so now what I'm seeing is that my life loss is strongly correlated with how many people are taking protective action over time. 
So this is really helpful to me, right? Because now questions that I can start asking myself is, well, how do I get people, how do we encourage people to take protective action more quickly? What can we do to sort of boost that if there's anything we can do to boost that? And again, keep in mind, this is all considering um, the uncertainty bounds we use, which in this case will always be zero to one. Uh, when we take PAI curve sample, um, what that means, and again, this is all shaded blue. This is our protective action initiation function where we're saying best case scenario, we're up here at this red line. Worst case scenario, we're down here at this blue line. Most likely, we're saying this is a triangular distribution. We're around this black line. And our protective action initiation function that we're sampling for an iteration falls somewhere in between, right? And so when I'm looking at this axis here, if I sample a zero, notice life loss is higher. That's telling me I'm sampling a function closer to this blue line. If I sample a one, I'm uh, sampling a function closer to this red line. So that's something I see a lot of people have questions about when they get in the LifeSim model. So I just kind of include it here so that when you get to that plot and you're trying to think through your uncertainty, um, you'll sort of understand what you're looking at a little bit more. So this one's sort of a fun uncertainty plot, and I hope I didn't steal any of Jesse's thunder tomorrow because he likes to talk about this too, but um, does anybody know why we might have this weird, this weird sort of trend? Um, notice this is life loss still on the y-axis, and down here we have our warning issuance, again, relative to breach time. So we're saying uh, people in the study area uh, receive the warning six hours after the breach, or around uh, two hours before the breach, somewhere in that range. And notice that when we're around here at two hours before breach, we have much less life loss than if I received the warning an hour or longer after breach. No ideas? Okay, so basically what's happening here is this is saying once we get to this point, it's safer for, for me to be in my home. So this is, an, this is an example where vertical evacuation might be a good alternative to your planning, um, your emergency planning. And so these are really interesting trends to look at. Um, and again, also why it's important to sort of have that, potentially have that sort of no warning, no evacuation scenario in your back pocket to help you sort of base your understanding of what your results could look like before you even run a simulation. Um, I think this is the last uncertainty plot, but also just another sort of interesting trend. And this is one um, that I want you to notice, um, sort of our x-axis down here. So again, still life loss y-axis, warning issuance relative to the hazard on the um, x-axis. And again, you see sort of this interesting inflection point. And I point this specific one out because notice if in, if in my model, I only had uncertainty bounds from around 20 minutes before um, breach to around 120 minutes before breach. If that was the only uncertainty bounds I had in my model, I wouldn't be thinking there was a lot of correlation between uh, warning issuance time and life loss, right? But because I've extended my uncertainty bounds here, now I see there's this inflection point where it really does matter. And it matters if I get to this warning issued, again, of course, prior to breach, um, because if not, again, there's a lot less uncertainty up here about what those consequences are going to be than there is uncertainty if we're somewhere over here. So I point this out to really point to the fact that your uncertainty bounds you choose are extremely important. Um, otherwise, these, these sort of images aren't really telling you the full story, right? Um, and this is what happens if you don't include uncertainty in your analysis. So again, I'm still looking at warning issuance time, life loss over here. And now these are each of these different colors are for a different emergency planning zone. So what is this telling me? I'm saying warning issuance happens eight hours before breach and life loss is, you know, zero to 10. That's not really giving me a lot of information, right? Because what if warning issuance happens here or it happens here for the same emergency planning zone? This tells me no information. So don't make this mistake and don't include uncertainty in your results, right? And so this is why uncertainty bounds are important. So these are sort of two scenarios that we model often in the core, which we refer to as our sort of minimal warning scenario and then our ample warning scenario. So what minimal warning would mean is that we're assuming the warning um, is issued somewhere uh, 
at breach to two hours before breach. So a very small window there. And then ample warning we would consider two hours prior to breach to six hours prior to breach. So you're given a little bit more leeway there. And those are kind of two standards we sort of um, use to help us get a grasp um, depending on what our failure mode is. So the minimal warning scenario is blue and the ample warning scenario is red. And notice that we have a difference in life loss here that's pretty significant. What you're seeing here is specific to the minimal warning scenario. So this is if I just had the uncertainty bounds from two hours prior to breach to time of breach. If I was only looking at the uncertainty bounds for the minimal warning scenario, again, I wouldn't see a whole lot of uncertainty here. So I'd be like, okay, I'm good to go. This parameter is not really correlated with life loss. No worries or uncertainties have to be somewhere else. Let's not worry about it. Or then I'm over here. Uh, now we're looking at the ample warning scenario where we're saying six hours prior to breach to two hours prior to breach. The warning is uh, the hazards identified, warnings issued. And we've got life loss, life loss still over here. Again, I don't see like it ever so slightly maybe goes this way, but I'm not seeing a lot of correlation here. So again, if these were the only uncertainty bounds I looked within, I wouldn't really be telling the full story, right? I wouldn't have a good understanding of what my true uncertainties are or, or what my uncertainty is or if it matters or if it's correlated to life loss for this particular parameter. So it's really important to always uh, test your own assumptions when you're sitting in like a risk assessment, for example, and somebody says, we have an overtopping scenario, we're going to be able to forecast this three days in advance, everyone's going to be out of harm's way, no big deal, you know, don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, but like, what if we don't, right? And then model that and get an understanding of what that would look like and be able to communicate that to other people. And overtopping, of course, is like, that's the one people like to talk about because it's usually easiest to talk through over topping, right? So I'm using it because I'm not an engineer, so it's easiest for me to talk about. But that could apply to any failure mode, right? And again, this is just kind of, again, saying this is just the same image. So if we don't have the uncertainty bounds, we see there's a difference in life loss, and this is just kind of one way of being able to view that. Uh, so sensitivity analysis, there's a lot of different types of sensitivity analysis. I mentioned that... Um, one of the easiest ways to do this within a consequence model or specifically a life sim model is to do what you call one at a time analysis. So you keep all parameters constant except one and you kind of tweak that one, run your simulation, see if it impacted your results. And so these are just kind of examples of things you might want to do that with. The, as we have seen, there's a lot of uncertainty, so kind of the options are limitless. And this is why it's important to use correlation plots and use your brain to sort of think through your uncertainties so you can identify what those key uncertainties, those instrumental uncertainties for your particular study area is, and then go through a sensitivity analysis for those parameters. So just a couple of examples. Um, you might do something with your road network where you say, okay, emergency managers told me they're gonna close off this particular road during a flood event and so that means if cars get there they're going to have to turn around so i just go ahead and i change the traffic pattern to allow people to go the opposite way there that way you can model that sort of effectively and then see okay if we do close this road we close this bridge what have you does that impact sort of our congestion in the area and estimated life loss um, structure inventories we talked about stability criteria the malpasse example was a good one of this where we had wood um, the wood um, anchored versus the masonry and how much that did impact our overall results. Um, I always like this one. If you sit in a elicitation with emergency manager, if you ever have, you already know this, but uh, Pendo and myself can both be sitting there and he can hear the emergency manager say one thing and interpret it one way and I can interpret it another way. So it's also a good place to do sensitivity analysis on there. So if Jesse and I or Woody and I, Jason and I are in an argument about what they were really saying, like I think they had great uh, preparedness. They were like doing a great job. Um, and so I interpreted across the board really good results for them. Um, that's going to look a lot different than if I said, yeah, I know they said they had this one thing, but it really seemed like everything else they said they didn't have this one thing and they weren't too sure about this. So model that and get an understanding of how the results um, in those parameters can change your overall results. And then you're also, to your point, able to more effectively communicate to emergency managers um, areas of improvement, right? Um, uncertainty bounds, we talked about that. 
And then, of course, again, scenario analysis, where you can consider sort of these best case, worst case sort of scenarios, um, and also consider differences in your hydraulics and hydrology. So we kind of already talked about uncertainty plots, box and whisker plots. This is more just kind of add-on bonus. Um, these are just kind of, I just want people to get a feel for all the data that's available that you can dig into to help you understand your uncertainties better. So we're not going to go through this exhaustively. If you're interested in it more, sign up for the Life Sim workshop that Woody puts on, um, and he'll go into a lot more depth on a lot of these things. This looks very similar to correlation plot, but it is not. This is an iteration of plot, so notice your x-axis change. So now what I'm looking at, um, the colors represent two different um, scenarios or minimal and ample warning scenario, and each dot represents one of the iterations in the Monte Carlo analysis. So this is really useful because I can say, okay, so this iteration had pretty low laugh loss, and this one up here had pretty high laugh loss. So I can do a detailed output and I can generate um, all the information specific to that iteration so I can understand, well, how do I have such a wide range where this is really high and this blue dot down here is really low? And that can give me some information to inform what my instrumental uncertainties are. Um, we also have, uh, this is all part of that detailed output analysis where you can look at um, how long it's taking um, evacuating groups to evacuate over time. You can um, see uh, the count of people that are able to evacuate over time and the difference between how many mobilized versus how many people actually reach safety. So this is really cool when you're doing scenario analysis on, or sensitivity analysis on your evacuation plans. Am I able to reduce this gap or does it kind of get larger when I make changes uh, in my road network trying to model these different scenarios? Uh, cumulative destination outflow, so our vehicles uh, that are going to these different destinations all represented by different color over time. So again, uh, doing a, we, we alluded to this before, but doing a traffic simulation can be very, um, uh, very tedious because it's really hard to consider where people are going to go and on what roads they're going to travel and all this information. So this is a good place where I can say, okay, well, what if I direct most of the people in this emergency planning zone to go to this destination because that's what the emergency manager tells me they're going to tell them to do. I can model that and I can say, okay, did a lot of people go there and what was the estimated life loss? And then what if we considered sending them to a different destination? Would that hopefully relieve some traffic congestion and hopefully reduce some life loss? So again, helpful tools and helping you identify how your sensitivities are affecting your results. Um, then we also, I'm not going to go through all of this, I just want you to see how much data, again, is available to you. Um, this is a summary average of results for your particular simulation. Um, and you can just, a couple of the key parameters, you know, you can see how many structures in total were inundated, your sort of statistical range of depths um, in different sort of uh, summary areas, however you lay those out. Then you can get more into your iteration, so your detailed output for a specific iteration, where then I can say, okay, in that one outlier where I had really high life loss, um, how many people did I have put in the high hazard zone? Does that make intuitive sense? Like, why would that happen? And you can kind of step through some of that. Then we've got more detailed output results, or, or sorry, this is, I said that backwards. This was what I was just talking about. Iteration results is across all iterations. So if I did a thousand iterations in my simulation, this is where I can find some of those results. And it, you could do the same thing over here though with your detailed output, where you can get an idea for a specific evacuating group, how many people got put in the high hazard zone, what roads they were getting caught on, and if there's something I can do to sort of cut that road off, reroute people, et cetera. So this is really helpful, especially for emergency managers when you kind of get in the weeds of all this stuff. Um, there's a lot of data and it can be very overwhelming. So um, I just kind of, again, show you all this to let you know if you want to know a specific something about a specific group, a specific structure, a specific iteration in your model, you can find it and it is helpful in helping you think through the uncertainties in your model. Then uh, we also have some data specific to our roads. Road details would be iteration specific. Road summary would be across all of your iterations and that can help you, again, identify some of those key things that we were just talking about. And then structure data, again, you can do iteration specific results or across all summaries. And this also helps inform um, your uncertainty analysis. 
One of the really neat ones that I, I like to use a lot is this hydraulic summary data. So this is really helpful in helping you understand arrival times to particular structures, arrival times to particular roads, um, and getting a good understanding what the depths and velocities of that are, uh, of each of those points would be. So you could, you could do this to um, any particular sort of um, shape file you wanted to. So again, most likely roads or structures. So this is from Joe Levy that we were talking about earlier, but what you're seeing happen is yellow dots are people getting warned, blue is vehicles evacuating. You can see how it kind of, the warning is um, moving throughout the, the study area. There you go, you start seeing the water come in. The red is meaning people are caught within their structure or if it's a vehicle or if it's a vehicle within their car. And so you, this is just really helpful tool in visualizing and help you, again, identify problematic areas um, and areas that you might need to zoom in on your model and start considering more in depth. So thinking about particular consequence areas, if you have, um, I'm from a rural area, so where I live, no one's gonna put as much effort into probably as they would the downtown area, right? So making sure that you find where people are in your study area and really zooming in on that and trying to make that as accurate as possible to help you get um, a full understanding of these sensitivities that you're testing. And so why does all this matter so much? So you saw this chart before where we have our um, annual probability of failure on our y-axis and our average incremental life loss on our x-axis. And so this is what we typically use in the Corps of Engineers and I think a lot of agencies use to help us sort of plot the overall results of our risk assessment. So let's say um, that I'm in this situation where I've built my life sim model, uh, all the engineers sat around, we came up with this uh, annual probability of failure estimate um, and that, that life sim result said, okay, I think life loss is probably gonna be in the 10 to 100 range. Um, and I feel pretty good about that. Like I've thought through a lot of my uncertainties. There's not really a lot of knowledge and certainties I have that I can reduce. We have some natural variability, but we've kind of looked at the full uncertainty bounds of that. And so we're pretty confident in these estimates at this point. But we're not so confident maybe in our probability of failure. So this is really, this is why all this matters, right? Because if I'm really certain, or I shouldn't say, I don't like saying really certain, if I'm confident that I have considered all of my uncertainties um, in a thoughtful way that makes sense, and I feel pretty good about my estimate, um, but my probability of failure, we're like, oh, it could happen more, it could happen less, we're just not really sure we have a lot of uncertainty. It really matters right when we're talking about our tolerable risk guidelines and how we would prioritize these particular projects to receive resources and funding. We could also have this other situation where I'm not very confident in my consequence estimates, but they're feeling pretty confident in their prob probability of failure estimates. This has the potential, well, if it's less, okay, we're not as worried about it, but if I just shift one box over, now I've, I've reached that tolerable risk guideline and I need to, um, we need to try to probably reduce some of these uncertainties and get a better understanding, do more analysis to help us sort of hopefully reduce some of this. So this is why it all kind of comes into play. And, uh, and again, this is one piece of that. The other piece is being able to communicate it uh, to our emergency managers, which this is all important because we need to be able to tell the story, right? And so the whole point of all this uncertainty analysis is you want to be able to say, does this make sense? Can I defend it? Can I interpret it? Can I communicate it? If not, I need to go back to the drawing board and make more iterations, make more refinements, get a better understanding, and be able to really tell people, okay, here's my estimated life loss, and here's why I think this so is So again, what it all is. this comes down to sort of telling the story and figuring out what those instrumental uncertainties are so that we can hopefully reduce them, hopefully um, reduce life loss. So again, all this comes down to sort of telling the story and figuring out what those instrumental uncertainties are so that we can hopefully reduce them, hopefully um, reduce life loss. Again, thanks for bearing with me. That one's not the most fun to sort of sit through, I know.